Well, everybody, welcome back. We have a question today. I don't know if you remember when the uh, managing director for the World Economic Forum, Adrian Monk, who's now, I believe, a member of the Social Democrat Party within the Dutch government. D- Danish. Danish government, sorry. Proudly declared in an article for Forums, welcome to 2030, I own nothing, have no privacy, and have never been happier. Well, today we're going to discuss if we even think that would be a possibility. And I want to give a shout out to Amanda, who helped us develop this episode, because we're actually going to be looking at the concept of property rights, personal property rights, and something called the circular economy. So all of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. Thank you so much for joining us. We are streaming on Rumble, the Nick Freitas YouTube channel, and the Making the Argument YouTube channel today on this stream. If you haven't already and you would like to help us choose future episodes, you can head down to the link in the description of this podcast, wherever you are. Join our community chat. We would love to have you there. And let's get right into the show. All right. As always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates. But other than that, a reasonably good guy with us today is not my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. She's out right now. We're actually processing chickens. Really? Yeah, we were processing chickens all day yesterday. That was a long process, no pun intended. Uh, But yeah, we were processing our property and I do own it. And we're going to discuss today whether or not I should. Then, of course, we have our political prognosticator and resident historian, Christian Hines. Hello. I have um, not actually read this entire article from beginning to end before, so today will be interesting. We're going to prove whether or not Christian can read on this episode. Right now. <laughs> and, of course, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. The comments on YouTube are already blowing up, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> Which I can't see them. I'm still gonna. I'm still getting your, your comments to me, so I apologize for a little bit of delay in there. Just a quick reminder for everyone, if you have a question for today's episode, please uh, post it in the YouTube chat any, on either of the two channels on Rumble. But if you could start your comment off with question and then propose your question, that would help us get to it and notice it. Okay, let's go ahead and kind of define our terms here. So we're going to be talking about property rights, but we're also going to be talking about personal property. These two things are a little bit different. We're also going to be talking about some various scenarios that sometimes come up whenever we're discussing these things. Plus, we're going to be discussing what is what role does property rights and personal property play in a socialist or communist society, a fascist society, a capitalist economy, and in this new thing called a circular economy. Economy, but before we get to all of that, let's go and uh, let's go ahead and listen to, or excuse me, read this this article here on "Welcome to 2030." I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. And and remember, this the is the infamous article. This is a yeah. This article got a lot of attention, and um, and and the author of this article um, got a, got a little bit of hate. Um, not to mention the fact that they, they came back and said that this was kind of like an, an inappropriate mischaracterization of what the World Economic Forum was trying to achieve through the very seminars that they were doing on things like the circular economy and stakeholder capitalism. Because God knows that whenever somebody reveals something that's being talked about at the World Economic Forum, it's never the fault of those of us who watched it, read it, and said, gosh, I think there might be some problems here. No, no, no. We're just bad faith actors. So let's go ahead and read it. And uh, let's see how not bad faith we can be. All right. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city. Or should I say our city? I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you considered a product has now become a service. We have access to transportation, accommodation, food, and all the things we need in our daily lives. One by one, all these things became free. Oh my gosh, free. So it ended up not making sense for us to own much. I'm really curious to see how it became free other than just a simple declaration of this article. First, communication became digitized and free to everyone. There it is again. It became So apparently if you digitize something, it becomes free. All right. Then when clean energy became free, holy crap. It, it, like just because it was for, okay. Things started to move quickly. Transportation dropped dramatically in price, but it's not free, I guess. It made no sense for us to own cars anymore because we could all, we could call a driverless vehicle or a flying car for longer journeys within minutes. Keep in mind, she thinks, she wrote this in 2016 and she thinks this is going to be reality in 2030. <laughs> we started transporting ourselves in a much more organized and coordinated way when public transport became easier, quicker, and more convenient than the car. Now I can hardly believe that we accepted congestion and traffic jams, not to mention the air pollution from combustion engines. What were we thinking? <laughs> Scroll down. Sometimes I use my bike when I go to see some of my friends. 
I enjoy the exercise and the ride. It get it kind of gets um, the soul to come along on the journey. Funny how some things never seem to lose their excitement. Walking, biking, cooking, drawing, and growing plants. It makes perfect sense and reminds us of how our culture emerged out of a close relationship with nature. Scroll down. In our city, we don't pay any rent. Of course, why would you need to? Because someone else is using our free space whenever we do not need it. My, are they paying rent? <laughs> My living room is used for business meetings when I am not there. Are they paying rent? <laughs> Once in a while, I will choose to cook for myself. It is easy. The necessary kitchen equipment is delivered at my door within minutes because that's what I want to use somebody else's egg beater. Since transport became free, again, we're not sure how, but it is. We stopped having all those things stuffed into our home. Why keep a pasta maker and a crepe cook and a crepe cooker crammed into our cupboards? We can just order them when we need them. I love it how it's like a pasta maker and crepe cooker. Like those that's the primary that's the primary things that we use when we're cooking. This also made the breakthrough of the circular economy easier. When products are turned into services, no one has an interest in things with a short lifespan. Everything is designed for durability, repairability, and recyclability. The materials are flowing more quickly in our economy and can be transformed into new products pretty easily. Environmental problems seem far away since we only use clean energy and clean production methods. Again, this is by 2030. By 2030. The air is clean, the water is clean, and nobody would dare to touch the protected areas of nature because they constitute such value to our well-being. In the cities, we have plenty of green space and plants and trees all over. I still do not understand why in the past we filled all free spots in the city with concrete. First of all, we, we don't. Second of all, pro- probably because it, it's, it's harder to build your businesses on like green spaces and park your cars in green spaces. But again, transportation is free and there are no cars anymore. Shopping? I can't really remember what that is. <laughs> for most of us, it has been turned into choosing things to use. Okay, so that would be, so basically you're shopping for services. Poof, now you remember what it is. Sometimes I find this fun and sometimes I just want the algorithm to do it for me. It knows my taste better than I do by now. The That's right, the... Oh my gosh. <laughs> when AI and robots took over so much of our work, we suddenly had time to eat well, sleep well, and spend time with other people. What's interesting is... There, there's an element of truth to this. Oh, we're going to be giving the devil his due in this episode. Oh, yeah. There's going to be some things that we look at. Like, some of this is not all bad. A big a big question is who controls it. Uh, some of it is horrible and just ridiculous. The concept of rush hour makes no sense anymore since the work that we can do can be done at any time. I don't really know if I would call it work anymore. It is more like thinking time, creation time, and development thinking time. Thinking time. It's thinking time. <laughs> this is, oh, my gosh. For, that's right. We, we don't need anyone to clean the toilets. It's 2030 and toilets are free. For a while, everything was turned into entertainment and people did not want to bother themselves with difficult issues. It was only at the last minute that we found out how to use all these new technologies for better purposes than just killing time. My biggest concern is all the people who do not live in our city, those we lost on the way, those who decided that it became too much, all this technology, those who felt obsolete and useless when robots and AI took over big parts of our jobs, those who got upset with the political system and turned against it. They live different kind of lives outside of the city. Some have formed little self-supplying communities. Others just stayed in the empty and abandoned houses in small 19th century villages. Wow. There's <laughs> there's somebody in the comments that just said, how much Soma is this author on? <laughs> <laughs> She's getting the orange ones, right? Or whatever color it was. What? Once in a while, I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy. Nowhere I can go and not be registered. Wow. I know that somewhere everything I do, think, and dream of is recorded. I just hope that nobody will use it against me. All in all, it is a good life, much better than the path we were on, where it became so clear that we could not continue with the same model of growth. We had all these terrible things happening, lifestyle diseases, climate change, the refugee crisis, environmental degradation, completely congested cities, water pollution, air pollution, social unrest, and unemployment. We lost way too many people before we realized that we could do things differently. Wow. Okay. So that's the that's the infamous article. I've heard conservatives talk about it 
a lot and libertarians. And I, and I got, by the way, I got this wrong. It was it was Ida Aachen uh, is a young global leader and member of the Global Future Council on Cities and Urbanization for the World Economic. Oh no, Forum. She, she's also a member of the. Of no, the I Danish know, but I, no, originally I said Adrian Monk. And that's uh, not right. yeah, was, yeah. Sorry, so I apologize for that. It, it was Ida Aachen. Um, yeah, young young global leader, member of the Global Future Council on Cities and Urbanization of the World Economic Forum. So again, this is one of those things when this article came out and people started to say, "Wow, this sounds." really freaking creepy not to mention the fact you never quite explained how everything suddenly became free like i don't pay rent why don't you pay rent well because other people are using my property do they pay rent for the property well it's not really my property it's just free at the time she wrote oh this she was a member of the danish social liberal party and uh two years ago she actually switched her membership to the danish social democrats so um, yeah, she's pretty pretty far on the left. Um, by by American standards, she would basically probably be like the equivalent of like AOC or Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Um, over in a country like Denmark, she would just be considered a part of the left, not the far left. But yeah, she's she's pretty left wing. Um, I. Yeah, I are, are so are we going to be like breaking down what we just yeah, read through? So- because here's the thing: as crazy as this article is. There, to, again, give the devil his due because yeah. that's one of the things that we actually like to do on this podcast yeah. is not just create straw men on the left, but but you know try to build up and then break down what they're arguing. There are actually, at the risk of getting dragged in the comments, yeah. um, there are Get actually guys. a couple things in here that I, I would argue are, are a good thing. There's a lot, I'd say 80 or 90% that's that's either outright dystopian or just completely nonsensical. Like, for example, who maintains the robots? And are they getting paid? Because apparently everything's free. So yeah. The robots maintain the robots, dummy. I mean, what this is, is ultimately <laughs> what this is, is a utopian vision of of almost like a classless Marxist, classical Marxist society, which is it, completely unworkable. But there are a couple things in here that... Again, to give the devil his due, I think that we're going to try to break down. We, we are. Well, look, we're going to we're going to get to that. We're going to get to the calm down, Christian. Stop jumping ahead in the outline. <laughs> Dang it! Oh my gosh! All right. First things first. So we've we've just been we've just been given a vision of a bunch of free stuff. Again, we're not sure how any of it became free except robots and AI apparently, and they're now monitoring your dreams. Like I wasn't sure. Yeah, that's. I dystopian. wasn't sure how they were monitoring my dreams in order to determine when I might need a, a pasta maker. But apparently, that's what the city of the future. Not to mention the fact that like I feel bad for all those people that don't live within our city. Like some of them are just living in little self sustaining communities. It's like oh yeah, gosh, I I can't imagine. Imagine why some people might not want to live in a civilization where apparently everything is owned by someone other than yourself and they're monitoring your dreams. Like, is this a, anyway, let's talk about what this means because she's just not, she's not talking about um, simply property rights. She's talking about personal property rights as well. And again, this was one of the questions that we had from our member uh, in, in our group and circle that said, hey, look, can we talk a little bit about this whole concept of personal property, property rights, et cetera? So let's let's define our terms. Okay, what are property rights? Well, property, private property is essentially that which is owned by an individual or group of individuals, essentially just not the government. So it can be owned. If a group of individuals come together, which is also you know traditionally been known as something like a corporation or an organization, whatever, that organization or entity can own property right? An individual can own property. And property is usually associated with things like, uh, or it, it includes things like building, land, et cetera. So when we talk about private property rights, we're not just talking about like your toothbrush, right? Your personal property is usually associated with things that are movable, right? So that could be appliances, that could be your car, that could be your clothes, your toothbrush. That's personal property. Okay. Now, obviously, there, there's some crossover here, right? There's there's some things that theoretically can move or be moved, um, which uh, would would fall into what we might call like the means of production. And that's one of the things that we want we want to discuss here is what do different econo- how do different economic systems view this whole concept of private property and personal property? So within a within a communist setting, right? And I'm I'm going to go and look at here. This is this comes from Workers World. 
Um, workers and oppressed peoples of the world unite. Right, this is a this is a Marxist page. A very non biased source. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to get what I, I want to hear from Marxists what Marxists think about this sort of stuff. Now, obviously, we could go and we could sit here and we could read through you know various writings on Karl Marx. I wanted a good summary. I'm not I'm not trying to you know hide anything or make a straw man. No, no, it's actually a fair thing to like say what did they yeah, themselves say but on this? Private property to a communist is not your shoes or toothbrush or even your house. That's actually incorrect. Those things are called personal property, once again, incorrect. And under socialism and under communism, they continue to belong to workers in much the same manner as they do now. Also, th this conflicts somewhat Marx. When Marxists speak of private property under capitalism, it refers to the tools of production that should be owned by all of society, such as factories, lands, stores, mines, and all those things that are gifts of nature or are built by many people over many centuries, but are now being monopolized by a few. These few don't concern themselves with how many years of human labor went into their creation, just so long as they alone can reap profits from legal ownership of that property. So you kind of see this is a caricature of what it means to actually own, own a business. Um, <clears throat> so, Typically, if you want to look at what Marx actually had to say about it, when he looked at the means of production, uh, the means of production first described by Marx and Engels consist of all the physical and abstract resources aside from labor that are used to produce goods and services. So this is where you go into not just like the factory, but like the tractor. This is where you go into you know various equipment or machine tools within that, that are specifically used to produce products. Um so Marx believed that none of those should be owned privately. Now, again, you'll get people like this who are now kind of re-envisioning this. And, and, and part of the reason why is because you try to sell Americans or Westerners in general on this idea that you can't own any private property to include your home. Yeah, that's going to be a hard sell. But if you say, no, 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 we're, we're going to now reorganize that or recategorize that as something like you know, personal property. You can own your toothbrush. You can own your cars. Those belong to you. It's not that the state owns them. But when it comes to all of the things that were necessary to build your house, to fill it with appliances, to make your clothes, no, no, those will be owned by the collective, right? So with, with, any, with any communist, within like in a pure communist state, they actually believe that eventually there'll be no government and everything will be owned by the proletariat. It'll all be owned by the people. The problem is, is the, the obvious question that always comes up is like, okay, if, if everybody owns the factory, does that mean anybody can go into the factory at any time, take a tool off the wall or like, you know, fire up the engines and start to create something who gets to decide what's being made in the factory. Yeah, How exactly. much of it is, is being that everybody made? does, does the whole proletariat vote on everything that's being? No, of course not. Right. So they would argue, well, maybe the workers in the factory would get to vote on what. OK, great. Show me a society that's managed to pull that off. Well, got a question from Mary here. How would children be classified under personal property in an article like this when it comes to medical and educational decisions? So are you talking from the con this article, like the communist I one? I think it was the first one. We went, we went, we went oh, over. well, that's that's interesting. So kids are not kids are not at least in the West. Kids are not um, described as their parents property. Uh what they are is that they're their own individual human beings. So the child is not personal property. Um, however, the parents are recognized as having the responsibility for the care, upbringing, and direction of they're the, the child. They're the legal guardian. They're the legal child. guardian, right? So what it is is that you know, for for general reasons within society, we have you know cutoff dates on like okay, once a child becomes this age, they're now considered an adult to the legal system. Now, obviously, some kids are are you know make better decisions at younger ages. Some, you know, are, you know, takes them into their thirties before they get their crap together. If even then, and, and we, we now know more, you know, it, it really is around your early twenties when your, your brain development, um, kind of comes to a, a full sense of maturity. All right. But for, for societal reasons, for legal reasons, we have to come up with a cutoff date in the United States. That's 18 for, you know, uh, when you're considered legally an adult, even though you still don't have access to everything, like in Virginia, you can't buy cigarettes, you know, you can't own certain firearms at the age of 18, right? But you can vote and there's other things you can participate in and you will be tried as an adult should you violate the law. So the idea is, is that up until that point, the parents are considered the legal guardian unless they violate certain basic human rights of the child. So this is why, you know, we, 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 we don't view people in general as property, nor do we view children as property. So they, they would not fall under this classification. Now, within a, within a communist uh, society, it ends up becoming very, very hard to see how someone doesn't actually, is not ultimately the property of the state, although they would never classify it that way. They would classify as, no, you're your own individual. But again, 
this whole idea like eventually there would be no there'd be no need for government because because we'd have such a surplus of goods and services once the people owned all the means of production and by the people really the only way that's ever really manifested itself is with the state even in, even in smaller communes that have attempted to live out marxist philosophy right there's still some sort of council within that um within that uh, co-op or, or commune or wherever it is, because there's always going to be questions on, okay, well, if these, if these things are owned in common, how do we determine that they're owned? And almost nowhere do you see people making unilateral or do you see people making purely democratic decisions on every single thing? Some, some brief backstory, a guy that we have talked um, about quite a lot in this podcast, Antonio Gramsci, when he was in Italy before he was thrown in prison under Mussolini, before Mussolini himself, actually, yeah. there was a brief period shortly after World War I where there were a lot of like upswelling of left-wing movements for a lot of reasons. The Italian economy wasn't doing well at the time. And there were these things called these worker councils that were popping up everywhere that yeah. were basically like trying to like take ownership of the factories, take ownership of the means of production, right? The problem was is that in the places where they were able to do it, the, the factories fell apart. They, 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 they stopped producing stuff efficiently and the market, it, the economy got even worse. And then the Italian socialists, um, who were basically at that point becoming more social democrats rather than actual socialists, they actually basically took a vote and, and um, attacked these worker councils and condemned them and basically said, we don't support these because they're destroying the economy. And Gramsci was upset about it. And he thought that the workers' councils were, oh, this is the revolution. This is, you know, we're about to replicate what they did in Russia. And when that didn't play out and the workers' councils fell apart and then eventually Mussolini came into power and then people actually threw their support behind, behind him, that's when Gramsci started looking at, at basically what had happened in Italy and, and started asking questions like, why did this fail? Yeah. And he didn't come to the conclusion that this failed because the structure that you just described is inherently unworkable. He came to the conclusion that it failed because, oh, well, there's too much material prosperity and people don't want a social system. This is why I need to come up with a new way to market Marxism to people. And yeah. he did everything else that he did. We know the rest of the story. But the point is, is that I, I find it kind of interesting that an attempt at what you just described has been made before. It's yeah. not like this is when, when people try to argue, well, real Marxism, real socialism, that's never been tried. It, it has. Yeah. Um, it, it, it has. And when it has failed and sometimes other leftists have identified that it's failed, the conclusion is almost never with these people. Oh, well, I guess capitalism is the superior system. It's always, there's some nefarious thing that's preventing it from working. Well, because again, it's one of those things. It, if I think this is one of the reasons too, where when we talk about the importance of property rights and personal property rights and things of that nature, it's because when we talk about freedom, we're generally talking about freedom from oppression. Now there's a lot of people on the left. You even see this with FDR and others that have tried to make it freedom from want. Like that's genuine freedom. So whatever system, you know, essentially it provides us with the most goods and services. That's the one that provides genuine freedom. And if that one requires more state control, so be it, because that's what, that's what really is freedom is. Now, what's interesting is that lo and behold, the society that's the most free from oppression, both politically and economically tends to be the one that provides both the most freedom politically, freedom from oppression and freedom from want. Now that doesn't mean that in a free society, everyone achieves the same level of wealth or economic, because not everyone achieves the same level of economic productivity, not to mention the fact that not everyone has the same objectives or the same values with respect to what they want to achieve. Um, but what, what's interesting, this is why Marxism constantly talked about creating the new socialist man, right? They, they actually understood that self-interest you know, what was the, was the main motivator in human action. Now I don't mean selfishness. That's different. Selfishness is the whole wanton disregard for others. Like I'm going to do what benefits me regardless how it, how it affects others. Self-interest is the thing that gets you up out of the bed in the morning and has you brush your teeth and shower and eat and things like that is because it's necessary for you to function. Self-interest is not in and of itself a bad thing. Selfishness is. That's that's the, the, the difference. The problem is, is that they didn't want you to operate off of self-interest. They wanted you to operate off of interest for the collective. The question has always been, who gets to decide what the interest of the collective is? And lo and behold, it was usually a small oligarchical you know, group of people, you know, the vanguard of the proletariat or whatever, that they were going to be the ones to decide. And don't you worry, you're, you're pretty little head about it. They would decide what it looks like. And oh, by the way, a key component of getting you 
to focus on what they decided was best for the the collective was eliminating this idea of the private me or the private ownership of the means of production. So so they had to do kind of a whole on you know onslaught on property rights in general, but even in personal property rights, there there was still limitations. All right. So the the thing to understand is that within a communist society, complete abolition of the private ownership of the means of production. And that's communist and socialist. That is the definition. So if they try to change it five minutes from now, I'm sorry, that is the definition. Personal property, there was limited ownership. But again, the problem is, is when the state is deciding what is produced at what quantity and what sort of distribution, your access to those things that would be personal property is now severely limited by the state institutions which are in charge of production. And it's not as if they have to be concerned with your wants necessarily, Right, so, so that's something to understand about how communist societies look at not only property rights in general when it comes to like means of production, land, buildings, things of that nature, but also your, your personal property as well. Secondly, I want to look at you know, how does fascism look at this? Because we've been told that fascism is the antithesis to socialism and communism. You They're know, not. All, all the anti-fascist, right, all, all seem to be socialist. I'm sorry. To just, use the Italian thing again, yeah, with you know Gramsci and post World War One and the workers, you know, councils and stuff like that. There was this guy that was also a part of the Italian Socialist Party around the time of World War One, and he thought that the uh, the most socialists in Italy were opposed to the war. Yeah, um, Italy ended up joining late. There was one guy though that was quite prominent within the movement that thought that oh no this war is actually a great thing because it can bring about the abolition of monarchy and the abolition of capitalism. We need to join the war and force the revolution. And his name was Benito Mussolini, <laughs> and yeah. he was thrown out of the Italian Socialist Party for yeah. being pro-war. Um, he he kept that strain of his politics throughout his entire career being pro-war, of course, um, and. He decided eventually that after that whole debacle and then after the failure of the um, workers' councils and stuff like that, that Italy needed a new political movement that retained the socialist economics of what the Italian Socialist Party was pushing for, but didn't have any of the international elements of socialism because the Italian Socialist Party was more about socialism than it was about Italy. And, and Mussolini basically tried to, to meld together the nationalist elements that he had always been in favor of, um, not always, but, but that he had long time been in favor of with the socialist elements of the Italian Socialist Party. And what he came up with was fascism. Now, he wasn't the only one. There were, there were a, a couple other, um, like, like Giovanni Gentile, I think, was, was like one of the early proponents of fascism. He came up with this concept called like actual idealism. That melded uh, that, that formed fascism. So, but that that's a whole nother story for another time. If we ever want to do like a more in depth, another maybe follow up in the future to to what fascism is. But the the point is is that um, Mussolini and Gramsci in many ways came from the same place. And fascism, if you want to understand the history of fascism, you can't separate it from the history of Italian socialism because it stems from it. This is part of the reason why I've I've always argued on this podcast and elsewhere that the reason that socialists and communists and fascists and Nazis hate one another is not because they're diametrically opposed to each other. They hate one another because they're vying for the same audience. No, I, I think I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think it actually plays out. Let me get one more question because sure. there's a great conversation happening in the comments from this. Yeah. How can you own your house according to this communist website, but not own the land because that's collectively owned? And then if someone wanted to build a golf course on that land, who would get to decide? You may have already answered. This no, no, bit, it's, it, it's, it's another one of these contradictions within the, the communist, you know, you know, model. Um, so no, it, it's, it's a great question. Now, you know, arguably what, what they would probably say is that, well, the collective would never decide to do that. <laughs> okay, but what if they did? What What is the legal prohibition on their being able to do that? Um, because there was a lot of things that I'm sure they believed the collective would never do. But you know what? Stalin did it. Lenin did it. Castro did it. Chavez did it. And, and the argument is, you know, oh, well, it, that wasn't real socialism. Like, okay, well, I, I'll tell you what. When, when, the, when the practiced version of what you want kills as many people as it does, I'm a little nervous that we can't handle the varsity version, right? Like if, if JV socialism keeps killing, racking up a huge body count, 
I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we want the varsity team coming in. Um, so no, it, it would, it would obviously be a, a huge problem. It's another one of these contradictions. If you really want a good argument, like that, I just think destroys socialism. It's the socialist calculation problem. And this was popularized by, by Ludwig von Mises, where he talked about how do they even, what, what by taking the private means of production out of there, by taking out the, the typical price structures associated, which make markets work. How, how do socialists even calculate what things are supposed to be, what, what they should be produced at, what the prices should be? How do they do that? And it's interesting because the socialists had a horrible time trying to answer Mises on this because, again, once you take away property rights and then limit personal property rights, you, you create far more problems than just the, the moral quandary of what happens when you deny people access to tools to acquire in order to provide goods and services and make their lives better, right? There's a moral problem. There's also a huge economic problem with this, and this is what we found and what Mises really uncovered. Um, now, I, I will say this. Under fascism, one of the things that is different is that there is more allowances for the ownership of private property and, and personal property within a fascist economic system than there is within a communist economic system. So for instance, fascism will allow for the private ownership of the means of production. However, it is significantly limited to the overall objectives of the state, right? So replace collective with state. And now the state will decide what should be produced or the state has a great deal of influence on determining what should be produced, what you can own, um, when you can own it, to what degree you can own it. So here's the question. If I own the factory, but the state is constantly coming in, giving me new objectives and prioritizing what it is I'm going to produce because the state speaks for the collective or the state speaks for the people, or as Mussolini said, everything within the state, nothing outside of the state. Well, then do I really own the property? See, see what the one thing the fascists kind of understood is that, okay, yeah, it does turn out that some people are actually better at running these things that I can't just build the property, put, you know, fill it full of all the, the gadgets and devices that are needed in order to produce the widgets and then hand that over to anybody and expect it to be run exactly the same way. There are some people that are better at running a fact, a particular type of factory than other people. And so Hitler even talked about doing this when, when he was setting up kind of the economic objectives of, of, uh, Germany. And remember, Germany was not just fascist. It was considered national socialist, right? They had their own doctrines that, that differed from elements of Italian fascism and, and replicated it in others. But Hitler used to talk about, it's like, we'll be happy to let these various companies be privately owned and produce things as long as they're doing so in line with our objectives. And provided that they do so well, they will continue to be able to do so. When they don't, we will nationalize or take over the industry. So here, here's my question. Once again, when we look at the nature of not only political freedom, but, but genuine freedom to be able to do what you want, property rights and, and personal property rights and access to the things that become personal property end up being pretty significant, end up being pretty important. Now, in the communist system, they say you don't have any private property rights. You can have limited personal property rights. In the fascist system, they, they say you can have limited property rights, but we will ultimately dictate what you do. And if you don't do it to our satisfaction, we will take it over or confiscate it, right? If you don't, if you don't work in accordance with the objectives of the state, right? And that, by necessity, limits your option to the things that you can own as personal property because in a market economy, Right? People are producing things based off of what consumers or customers demand. Right? I'm, I am rewarded in a market economy by, by doing a better job using scarce resources in order to provide the products and services that you want on the open market. And oh, by the way, no one's forcing you to do business with me. But if the state within a fascist economy comes in and says, we want to engage in a series of cartels, so we'll allow these companies to exist, but they're not going to engage in a kind of dog-eat-dog -dog competition with one another. They're going to have their respective geographical areas that they're responsible for supplying, and they are going to organize themselves and their boards of directors and their things like that in accordance with with state mandates on how those should look, and then they will produce in accordance with state objectives on what they should produce. So once again, how free does that sound to you? Like, do you really own your property if you can't, if you really have very little say on, on how it's being utilized? I, 
I contend that you don't really own your property if it gets taken away when you don't pay property taxes. I mean, that is a that is a that is a fair argument. We'll get into some of the differences on that when we talk about what we call free market economies. But uh, essentially, the the point that I want everyone to understand here is that one of the things that fascism and communism share with respect to property rights and personal property rights is that's very very limited and almost always directed by the state. I once. Um I, I ran into this this problem where most people that are listening to this podcast, either listening at home or, or or watching us on YouTube, have probably had an instance where they've either directly got into an argument with somebody on the left or seen somebody else get into an argument with somebody on the left on on oh well the Nazis were capitalists. So I actually I <laughs> I, I wrote something to that uh, a couple months ago on March six on Facebook and I said, Oh yes, my favorite aspect of capitalism is when a government party official with a gun <laughs> tells me what I'm allowed to produce, how much I'm allowed to produce, what prices I must sell at, and who I'm allowed to sell to, all while being under threat of being put into a slave labor camp if I disagree. Gosh, what a truly free market. <laughs> Give me well, a break. So that, that leads us to this third category, right? And that, that's what we call capitalist or, or generally free market economies. Now, let me just go ahead and say this right off the bat because I can already see everyone in the comments about to yell at me. <laughs> I recognize <laughs> that we do not live in an overwhelmingly free market economy within the United States. There, When you have 77,000 pages of federal codes Obviously, there's some issues there. What I'm talking about is that when you look at when you look at the spectrum, both geographically and historically, the United States, you know, exists more on the freer end of the economy. If you want to look at ones that are even more economically free, that's where you would have gotten into, you know, Hong Kong five years ago. It's where you would have gotten, you know, Singapore, Taiwan, um, you know, e even even countries like, uh, you know, Switzerland. Um, these ones are all on the on the higher end of economic freedom. And, and so what does that mean? Ec free market economies and capitalist economies tend to prioritize private property rights, which maximizes not only your ability to own the means of production, but also tends to produce an environment where you have a much you know, far more options with respect to your personal property, right? So again, private property can be everything and, and is generally, you know, includes land, the building, and everything else. Personal property is those movable objects, your appliances, your clothes, your toothbrush, your car, et cetera. So the question is, is which one of these societies actually produces better, you know, general freedom, political freedom, as well as freedom within the marketplace. And it, it tends to be those economies which place a high value on private property rights. One of the things that's interesting is you can go on the uh, Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom, and what you're going to see is a huge correlation between property rights and freedom in general the freedom of individuals to live their life the way they want, free from government direction or oppression, et cetera. The moment the government starts taking more of those items, ostensibly to provide greater equity or equality within the economy, what generally ends up happening is that not only are you diminishing your overall freedom, because again, freedom is not just getting to elect your officials. Freedom is having the, the maximum amount of decision-making power that you have over what you use with your abilities, your talents, and your resources, right? It's that whole decision-making process. One of the things we say commonly on the show is most of your problems are not solved by politicians or bureaucrats. Most of your problems are solved by working in voluntary cooperation within the marketplace to include working with people that you didn't even recognize you're working with. Right when you go and you make a purchase at the store in a in a, a market economy, not only are you working with the the retailer that you bought the pencil for because you know you you took your money, you gave it to them, you got the pencil, right? Both of you are made better for the transaction because you valued the pencil more than the money, and the store valued your money more than the pencil. So both of you are better off from this transaction. It's not that one got over on the other, right? But you making that transaction also sent the signal to the retailer that, oh, I've got people buying pencils. I'm probably going to need to order more, right? Which sent the signal to the factory, oh, I'm going to need to produce more pencils. I should probably order more of the resources that are going to be necessary, expand production, or maybe hire more capital equipment or get more people to come and work for me. So all of these signals are being sent, not because you sat down at a calculator and figured it all out. It was because you needed a freaking pencil. This is why we say the, the invisible hand of the market 
will solve these problems. When the left says, who will organize these things? Who's going to dictate these things? And then the, and then conservatives say, well, the free market will. We get mocked for that when yeah. we say it. But when we say it, what we're doing is, is that we're defending hundreds of millions of people making the decisions of what gets made. That is actually more in line with the stated mission of what these people claim yeah. to want than having some bureaucrats decide it. Yeah. Because what we're saying is the people as a whole, as consumers, they get to decide ultimately what's being made and at what prices it's being sold at because their actions voting with their feet or voting with their pocketbooks and deciding what to purchase and what not to purchase sends signals to the market of what to produce and what to charge for that produce. When you remove that from the equation and you now hand those decision-making, because somebody's going to decide this. Somebody, yeah. somebody, somebody will, decide will decide it. So the question is, who's going to be sending those signals? Is it going to be me and you or the people listening to us at home? Or, 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 you know, driving in the car or, or watching us on YouTube? Is it, is it going to be those people deciding what goods and services are being produced and at what price they're being sold? Or is it going to be government officials doing it? And even worse, are we going to say, oh, it's okay. We're going to vote to decide, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who's going to be making those decisions. That's not freedom. If we all get together and we vote on which government, you know, bureaucrat and busybody gets to set prices and wages and, and, um, gets to set, you know, ratios and quantities and quotas, Yeah, you're inherently going to create inefficiencies within the marketplace. More so, there's always going to be inefficiencies because nothing will ever be 100% efficient, at yeah. least on this side of, you know, of okay. heaven. But, 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 but the fact is, is that you're going to inherently create more inefficiencies within the marketplace when you do that. Because how on earth can you possibly know the needs, wants, and desires of what, seven, eight billion people well, and that, in the and world or 330 million Americans? So, so, pe so people might look at this and be like, all right, Nick, we're talking about personal property. First of all, I want to say thank you to Tui for your donation. Really appreciate it. Um, and and the, the comment that he made about you will own nothing equals socialism, a.k.a. slavery, where you are owned by the state. And again, it, that's a fair point. So people will ask, okay, this seems like a, this seems like a very economically fo focused um, discussion about socialism, communism, fascism, capitalism, free markets. What does this have to do with property rights or personal property? Because let's face it, right? when we talk about freedom, when we talk about what it means to be free, we're talking about freedom from an outside entity being able to oppress you and you getting to live your life the way that you want in order to pursue happiness, in order to take care of yourself, your family. In order to do those things, you have to be able to utilize you know, various things that you have available, which again, initially, what do, what do you have? You have your labor, right? You have your mind, you have your work ethic. And then over time, what it is, is you acquire both experience and tools. Those tools can be in the form of intellectual tools. Those tools can also be in the form of physical tools. If you are not allowed to own the physical tools, which increase the productivity of your labor and your ideas, well, then who owns it? And, and this idea, well, it's just going to be owned by the people. Okay. Well, here's what I've noticed about countries with like the People's Democratic Republic in the title. There seem to be a, only a couple people at the top deciding for the people what the people will do, what the people will own, where the people can go, what the people can say. So I'm sorry, but I've noticed a trend over time where regardless of what you claim your philosophy achieves, it seems to do something very different. And every time I point that out, you don't get to look at me like, well, that wasn't the real thing. Like, well, gosh, damn, I'm scared to death of the real thing. <laughs> Again, if the, if the light thing does this, I don't want the full, I don't want the full Monty, right? Keep that cut. I've got a store and, 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 um, college, uh, I was taking a class, um, on, you know, the, the, basically the, the history of, you know, the, the modern era, right? You know, World War II, the Cold War. And the the topic of Yemen was brought up. And Yemen at the time, now it's a unified country, although there's a breakaway movement going on. That's why they have a civil war. Um, but, but at the time, Yemen was split into two separate countries because of colonialism. And then after um, the, the British pulled out, um, there was a North Yemen and a South Yemen. And there was somebody in the class that was like, South Yemen, uh, wasn't that a, a democracy? And the professor said, well, actually, the official name of Yemen was uh, of South Yemen was the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. And I remember uttering out, oh, so it was a Marxist dictatorship. 
<laughs> what, did, what did he respond with? He was like, correct. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank GA Patriot too. He says, democracy, people elect their leaders. Republic, people elect their representatives. See the difference there. And he's talking about the idea between leaders versus representatives, right? You know, it, it's interesting. We've, we've had that discussion before too on the whole, co- we actually had a whole podcast dedicated to the idea of talking about what are, what are the differences between, you know, democracy versus, you know, direct, direct democracy, democratic processes, a Republican form of government, constitutional Republic. And it is an important question. Let me, let me look at, um, are we, are we at the point now or or are we at some point going to go back to the, the whole, I own nothing and give it its That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do next. Right. So we, we've, we've defined our terms on what property rights are. We've defined our terms on personal property rights. And we've talked about how different economic political, political systems look at that from, um, you know, uh, Communism, which is no property rights, limited uh, personal property. Fascism, which is limited property rights, uh, severely limited property rights, severely or, and limited and kind of by uh, by action, limited personal property rights. And then free market economies are capitalists, which is more expansive property rights and more expansive personal property rights. That's that's how those systems look at this. Now, again, for people that are looking at this saying, well, that's an evil caricature, I, I want you to keep in mind how these different systems place values on things. The reason why a a communist will look at, no, you shouldn't have property rights is because what they're valuing is the provision of certain services and equality within society. And they think that's actually best achieved if you don't have the means, if you can't own the means of production, right? If that has to be owned in common or by the state, right? So it's a different value system. So I'm, I'm not saying this is a pejorative. I'm, I, I believe I'm accurately describing what they want and why they valued it that way. And then with the fascist system, there, there's the same elements there, but they allow for slightly more ownership at the, at the personal level because they see it as a way to deal with the natural component of human self-interest. And then obviously within the market economy, it's, especially a laissez-faire economy, it would be massive and expansive property rights and personal property would therefore be available in large quantities, or at least that's what we've seen work out. So the third thing, or the last thing that we're going to get into with respect to systems is this whole idea of the circular economy. Now, when we read that article, let's go back to the Forbes article um, from Ida. When we read that article, she briefly mentioned the circular economy, but she didn't actually do anything to explain it. So what is the circular economy? And the reason why we're going to talk about this in terms of property rights and personal property is because... They are, they are envisioning a different way the economy can work. And again, don't, don't throw anything at me. Not everything that they're saying is bad. It really is just a question of who decides. And the problem is, is that most of the people pushing for this think that ultimately it's wise leaders like them through government agencies and through organizations like the World Economic Forum that should be the ones to decide because obviously they're the enlightened ones that came up with a lot of these concepts. So the way that the circular economy is supposed to work in, 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 in contrast to what they call the linear economy. So the linear economy would be you go and you extract the resources and you produce the resources and you make a product or you make a service or, or and, and really more they're talking about products, but you make a product, right? And that product is meant to then be sold in the economy to now be owned by the person who buys the product, right? This all makes sense. This is typically how things work. And what they're saying is that that incentive structure creates, um, in some ways, a perverse incentive. That it's all about producing something as quickly and as cheaply as possible with no real thought of either recycling it, reusing it, repurposing component parts for other things. Um, Because, again, they don't own it after they produce it, right? They just throw it out to you, now you own it, and then when you buy it and you use it and then it breaks down and you get mad and you got to buy another one and you take the old one and you throw it in the dump and now you got to pay additional fees to have it disposed of and it sits in a landfill and that's that's bad right that's the linear economy it goes from creating something to waste right the circular economy is a concept which essentially says that okay well instead of this ownership focus on everything we're going to start looking more deliberately at the the um the beginning parts of the production line And when we look at the beginning parts of the production line, we're going to put more emphasis on long-term quality, recyclable, reusable, 
right? So the idea would be that instead of produ- instead of taking these scarce resources in order to produce something which is going to break down and end up in a landfill, we want to produce something that is either going to last longer, right? Or when it, when it reaches the end of its life cycle or technology advances beyond it, it's going to be super easy to take the, com- the component parts that still have value and utilize them for other purposes, right? So that's the circular component. Now you look at that and you think, all right, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with anything that you just described. So why is it that somebody else came to the conclusion that what this is really going to equal is, you know, basically a city where you don't own anything and you have no privacy Yeah, and you have no privacy. And, and this is, this is the, this is the part where the catch comes in because I was listening to a, a podcast uh, recently and, and I'm, I'm trying to remember, uh, what was oh McKellen Arthur I think uh, Ellen MacArthur I think was the, her name, and she she has been <clears throat> funding a foundation for like the last ten years on this whole idea of the circular economy. Um, <laughs> she she used to like do long term boating competitions, right? So clearly someone that came from the proletariat class. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, she. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to denigrate her for doing that. That's perfectly fine. But long term boating and and things like that, right? So that's what she did. And she talked about how she kind of realized when she would go on these like really, really long, you know, you know, crossing, you know, the Pacific Ocean and things like that. In order to properly plan for it, you had to really, really be careful with how you utilized your resources. And you had to mathematically look at everything from the point you started to the point because you didn't want to be too heavy. Right. But you also don't want to run out of food three days before the competition. In the middle of the Atlantic. Right. Yeah. It's because, and and there was consequences for this because it could take days for someone to get out to you, like all of these things. And that caused her to start looking at things from the standpoint of, well, gosh, you know, we live on a, on a world with finite resources. And, and then she started to do something which has always been problematic whenever people start to get this idea. She goes, I started looking at things like we only have 118 years of, of coal left. And, oh, my gosh, we only have 60 more harvests left of topsoil in, in many areas. And, we all, and, and this is the part where you start to see, okay, conceptually, there's nothing wrong with this idea of wanting to encourage greater efficiency within the economy. It becomes problematic when you start looking at resources based off of current extraction methods, based off of current availabilities versus current productivity versus current efficiency models, and coming to the conclusion that, oh my gosh, we're, we're, this is what Malthus did. This is that kind of Malthusian idea. Yep. This is what I can't remember. Oh, who was the guy? Um, who was the guy that, that constantly, I think he wrote the Paul population. Ehrlich? Yes, Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich. Is a is a very well paid tenured professor that quite frankly shouldn't have a job anywhere because of all of the crappy predictions he made with you know all of these resources are going to be gone we're going to have massive famines across the country because what he was doing is he's looking at current models and then projecting that out into the future as if there will be no you know future technological developments or improvements with respect to processes or alternative resources that can be used to achieve similar effects right it's just this this kind of doomsday version of everything's going to hell in a handbasket we're we're all about to die and we've got to do something well whenever you're using that as your method for, for figuring out long-term sustainability you tend to favor approaches which put a lot of power into the hands of a small centralized force which can compel you to do what they want. You know what I just realized? What? This article from Ida Aachen um, was published before COVID. Yeah, it was. Wow. That's because if you think about it, there's actually a lot in here mm-hmm. that I, I don't think she got her timetable right. Right. You know, we're, we're, she, she, she talked about 2030 when this would happen. I don't I don't think that's that's at this point possible. But no, no. consider how where we were in 2016 when she wrote this yeah, and where we are today, I would argue that there's actually substantial amounts of, of overlap in terms of like progress towards what she's talking about, which in many, many ways is, is very frightening. Yeah. Um, there's a couple things though, to again, to give the devil its due that, that, that she talks about that I, I don't think are necessarily bad until you ask the question of, like you pointed out who earlier, decides. who decides? Well, if it's if it's an intentional community, we've talked about that many yeah. times on this podcast. There's nothing wrong with implementing a a circular economy 
within a, a, a um, network of people that you're voluntarily choosing to work with. Yeah. Um, but there's a huge difference between that and codifying through legislation the the implementation and imposing of her vision of a of a city of the future by force well, and, and, and I, coercion. And I will say to her credit, one of the things that she talked about in her podcast was that in, in order for this to work, it actually has to work. It can't just be imposed. And and she's she's right about that. Um and and Naya asked a, a really interesting question. Okay, so they want cars to last longer, not become rusting scrap. Don't cars from the 60s last forever? Why don't they just make more of those? Here's what's interesting. Cars in the 60s, those like big, heavy steel cars and stuff like that. Tanks. You know, they But they actually perform worse in crash tests with respect to the safety of the people inside them. Because current cars are, are designed in, in large part in order to when they come in a, a collision or things like that, they collapse a certain way, which actually provides greater safety to the, the overall passengers. Not to mention the fact that if, if you offered a whole line of cars made to similar specs as in the 60s, let's take out all the government regulations and let's say, because part of that's influenced modern car manufacturing, but let's take all that. Would people choose that over, you know, other if models you're talking right design, absolutely. 1950s and 60s <laughs> cars. I really wish that car manufacturers would make modern cars that look like 50s and 60s cars because 50s well, but, and 60s cars look better. I know that's not the question, yeah, the, though. The, but. Point, the, point, <laughs> the point is, though, is that it, it's a good point because you can always point to something and say, okay, well, this lasted longer. Like So, for instance, we did a why minute a while back on why your grandma's dishwasher uh, lasts longer than yours. And mm -hmm. it turns out it has a lot to do with energy efficiency requirements from the government. The government came in and, and started to limit what you could use, the water you could use and stuff like that. So now the, the result, the, the intention of all that policy was this is going to be better for the environment and long-term sustainability. The result was, is people had to run their dishes two or three times in order to actually get them clean, which actually reduced the overall life cycle of the dishwasher. Very so, similar story to electric cars nowadays. Yeah, so it's this whole idea of, again, there, there could be a good argument for a, a more sustainable model. Like, for instance, one of the things that uh, Ellen MacArthur talks about that I, I think there's a lot of um, um, agreement on in many areas is this whole idea of more emphasis on composting and organic farming as opposed to the heavy fertilizer version or the heavy feedlot version. And there are advantages to that. But the, the, obvious, the obvious rebuttal to that is, well, if you want to be able to feed people at similar rates, right, then, then organic farming and, and those methods of farming are going to have to become more prominent and develop more efficiencies, right? That's, that's not a bad thing. Um, so this is the part where we go on the whole give the devil their due. Is, yeah, is, I was about to ask you, like, like what in her, because we read this article at the beginning of the podcast. Yeah. What do you, because there's probably not a lot. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, like, like, what do you agree with that's in here? So here, here's what's interesting about some of the things, not so much in the article. I, I think this article is like bat crap crazy. The, this whole idea oh, that I totally a, AI and robots by 2030 have made everything free. How? We don't know. It's just free. Trust me. I'm with the government and I'm here I mean, to I, I will say that I do think that AI and, and, and robotics will make a lot of things much cheaper. That was one thing that that was one thing that she actually wrote in the article that I believe is technically true. There's a lot of people that get very concerned when you have what they call disruptive technologies that come into the marketplace and and disrupt the current labor market. And people get very concerned about that. And for good reason. If your job is about to be replaced by a robot, you're a little bit concerned about where you're going to work next. It's one of the reasons why, too, in, in high-functioning economies, you don't actually send kids to a public school system that teaches them how to be good factory workers so they can compete with robots that they can't compete with. You put them into actual fields where they learn important things about investment, entrepreneurship, and high-tech jobs that are going to exist through the span of their lifetime or allow them to easily adapt. Yeah. Right? So the, the problem... Um, Learn so, to code. So when, yeah, <laughs> when, when she's talking about you know robots and, and mechanization being able to do more in the economy, we know that's true. Yeah. We know that's true. We know you can do a lot more. We know that one person plowing a field is not going to be able to do as good as one person driving a tractor, right? That it, and that's not a bad thing. But you can employ a lot more people to manually plow a field than you can if you just have one person driving a tractor. Well, this but, is, but that doesn't. To your point, yeah. That, that th th this is why, like the Luddite movement 
in the it, you know in, in Britain during the like 1700s was a terrible thing because yeah. at the time that was like the first industrial revolution and there were all these people that were having their jobs be re- being replaced through industrialization for basically the first time ever. Oh, I, I, and they went to the factories and started smashing them to pieces because they were like these, you know, you know, the industrialization is going to take our jobs. But we look back at this hundreds of years later and we say it was a net positive for humanity that we industrialized. Yes. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Ted Kaczynski, yeah. who just passed away a few days ago, um, he was not correct. If, <laughs> when he wrote, um, what was it, Industrial Society and Its Future, his manifesto where he yeah. basically advocated for, like, uh, um, you know, Henry David Thoreau-style return to nature. He's wrong. Yeah. He, it, it, we are better off in a post-industrial society than we are in a pre-industrial one. Well, and that goes, so Marcy uh, Kessler asks, okay, Nick, but why do modern cars, appliances, et cetera, have to be so short-lived and disposable? What value is it in filling up landfill with all these disposable, non-recyclable things? Marcy, excellent question. And you're right, that's a problem. Here's what we should also look at. Why is that happening? Well, the 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 socialist argument is that the reason why that is happening is because rich, greedy capitalists and corporations have no incentive to make, they just want to get you the cheapest you know, thing that they can get out of the world in order to maximize profits, and that's it, right? And so that's what they do. They sell you crap because they have incentive in you coming back and buying more crap once the crap you bought craps out, right? That's, that's the argument. That's the explanation for it. And, and does that happen within a market economy? Yes, Absolutely it happens because, again, we're all fallible human beings. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes other people are nefarious and are attempting to do that. Here's the difference. When the state does it, you don't have an option. When the state manufactures your crappy car that you have to be on a wait list for five years to get, Soviet Union, right? And then the car shows up and it doesn't work. What are you going to do? You're going to go complain to the the commissar on, on car manufacturing? No, you're screwed. You get what you get. Right Within a market economy, if someone sells you a crap car, there better be some contravailing benefit to that. Like So for instance, maybe the car is not as long lasting because it's cheaper and that's all you can afford. So now it wasn't a question of a good car versus a bad car. It was a question between a mediocre car or no car. Right, So that could be one motivation for selling you that sort of vehicle. The other thing is, is that if they create something that is just functioning poorly, they go out of business. And we see this all the time within market economies. People that don't use scarce resources effectively in order to provide consumers what they want eventually go out of business unless the government comes in to save them. And that is what you're seeing in different parts of the economy. We've seen this with GM. We've seen this with like, oh my gosh, look, we saved this iconic American car company. Okay, well, did you? Or did you just take a bunch, did you forcefully confiscate a bunch of money from people that didn't want to buy a GM and then give it to the corporate board of GM in order to keep them going? And and the lesson, of course, GM learned from this is we can make really bad, stupid decisions. And if we have enough political top cover, they'll steal money from people who aren't even our customers to give it to us. So you're, you're right. There is a huge problem. And and a lot of the problems that we have with our appliances now are a direct result of government intervention in order to try to achieve, wait for it, sustainability, eco-friendly systems. Because I I don't know if you know this, but that dishwasher that doesn't work worth a dang sitting in a landfill, that's super good for the environment. Yeah, it's super good. Like I remember in, in California when they just said, hey, we're not going to do all these controlled burns. We're not going to allow people to cut down any trees because we love the environment and we want to protect it and we don't need this smoke going in the air and we don't need these other things. And then the town of Paradise, which my in-laws lived in, town of Paradise burns to the ground. I got a question. Where do you think more bad particles and pollutants went into the atmosphere and the water and everything else? Do you think more went in with doing controlled burns and allowing people to be able to selectively cut trees and get rid of underbrush? Do you think more of it happened then? Or do you think more of it happened when a town of thousands of people went up in flames? Right? Like even if you don't care about all the people displaced or all the people hurt because you're the sort of person that thinks that people are killing the, the planet anyways, what do you think was worse for the environment in that situation? So the, the point that I would make is, Marcy, it's, it's an absolutely fair uh, point that um, we, we do want better products and we do want more sustainable products, right? It's, it's a great thing for there to be greater efficiencies within the marketplace uh, and within the, the products that we use and we consume and that we potentially recycle. 
the real question is, is what system does a better job of doing that? Is it the systems that respect property rights and personal property rights or are the systems that try to control things through centralized planning of the economy? And, and what we see time and time again, even in what people will, will list is like, oh, the, the rainforests are being cut down in large part to, to feed the beef consumption within the United States. Okay, fair critique. Now, here's my question. Are you going to solve that by putting the government in charge of that process? Because I remember when the Soviet Union destroyed the Aral Sea in order to try to help agriculture. Yeah, what a bang-up job they did over there. Created a, a humanitarian and ecological disaster that's still playing out to this very day. Um, we did a Y minute on that. It's probably one of my favorite ones that we've ever, yeah, it was a great we've ever one. done. Yeah. Christian is the one, Christian's the one that found that topic, did the research and wrote a great script for it. It was an excellent Y minute, uh, because it just seems so counterintuitive. Like, wait a second, how could a, how could the, I mean, the same people that are telling us that the way that we're going to help the environment is by giving the government more control over property and the economy. Okay. Well, here was an example of a government that had a whole heck of a lot of control over the government and property, or excuse me, over the economy and property. And oh, by the way, was doing this in order to help agriculture. Literally destroyed a sea. Like you go back and look. There's at boats maps. in the middle of the desert now. Yeah. And people are like, how did that happen? They're like, <laughs> yeah, go, go back and look at what, what government-sponsored environmental so, policy did to the environment. You said earlier that Ida argued, maybe outside of the context of this article, but later, yeah. because she got a lot of blowback for this. Yeah. I do remember that. Oh, yeah. Um, Big time. Again, even though this is the first time I've actually read the entire thing from beginning to end, I remember hearing about it a lot. And you pointed out that she argued, well, in order for this to work, it has to work. Um, it can't well, just be Well, that was someone else. Oh, somebody else yeah, said somebody that. Okay. else said that. So... I mean, if that's the case, then then it does. Because I was about to argue, it sounds like that she's contradicting herself because isn't she arguing? No, no, no. She, she was at, one of the things that I, I thought was interesting, she was actually uh, arguing, she, she seemed to be making an argument or, or at least possess a general understanding that this system has to actually work better. One of the things I appreciated about her whole approach was so much of what we talk about now has to, about reduction, reduction, reduction. Um, reduce consumption, reduce this, reduce that. She's like, I, she goes, I think you're going to have a hard time selling people on that if that's what you really want, especially when we get treated to horrible prediction after horrible prediction after horrible prediction, which never comes true. So she's like, no, I, I want people's lives to be better. I think that we can achieve that through greater efficiency within respect to how we use our resources. But here's, here's where it gets funny. So she started giving examples. What are some examples of the kind of circular economy, the kind of sharing economy that Ida was attempting to explain? So remember, Ida was saying, I don't pay any rent because other people use my apartment. I don't own a car because I can just get a ride. I don't, you know, um, you know I, I don't own a bunch of cooking stuff because I can just have it sent to me. Okay. The examples that she used, not Ida, but um, I think, again, Ellen MacArthur. The, the example she used with things like Uber, things like Airbnb, things like your cell phone plan. And she said, isn't it interesting that most people, when it comes to their cell phone, do they own their cell phone? Sure. But they're a part of a plan to where when, that, when technology surpasses that cell phone, every two to three years, they get a new one provided they send theirs back in. Now, why do they want it back? Well, because it actually helps them reduce overall costs because they can either sell that phone at a reduced rate to somebody else or they can use components within that phone for other purposes which have value. And one of the things she said that was impressive, which is like, we have to do this by creating value in doing it. Not just by demanding that we do it, not just by dictating that we do it. Yeah, because not just like by saying, some... not just by saying, if you don't do this, you're going to kill the world, right? You you actually have to bring value in doing it. And she goes, and certain companies like Airbnb. What does Airbnb produce? Nothing. Airbnb produces one thing. They produce an infrastructure where people that already own houses can go onto their website and be automatically treated to a customer base that is looking to rent space they're not currently using. So when we look at it in those terms, that's an efficiency within the marketplace. Now, it's not. It, I don't have to just look at for available hotels or motels. I can go on Airbnb and I can literally stay at someone's house who I've never met before, and they might be able to either 
meet my demands as a customer based off of price or based off of access and placement, right? Where, where are they located in, in respect to what I have to do in that particular area? Or it might be that they offer some sort of neat experience, or it might be that they have a really, really cool guest house. These, yeah. all these things, there's now all these brand new mechanisms that were already demands in the marketplace. We just, the only way we knew to get them was through motels or through hotels. And now all of a sudden, an existing resource was put to use in order to achieve incredible productivity. And I remember, you remember this too. Remember very early in your political career, this was like maybe within a year or two of you first getting elected. I certainly remember this. There were a lot of local governments facilitated by the state. I remember it was a Republican state senator that submitted legislation that ultimately passed to allow for the over-regulation of, of, Airbnbs. of Airbnbs to basically remove them from existence mm -hmm. um, or give localities the ability to remove them from existence. And there were a lot of localities, Culpeper being one of them. I also remember Chesterfield being another one uh, for a while that were trying to hyper-regulate these um, the, the Air Airbnbs and, again, remove them from existence. And I remember getting into an argument with, with several members of my county's Board of Supervisors, this was like within a year of this legislation being passed. So this was what, like like 2016 or 17 or something like that. And I was arguing like, like who are you to tell somebody that they are, they're not allowed to rent out their house to somebody that wants to rent it? Yeah, It's not your property. Who are you to tell them that? And they just kept saying, well, we can't, you know, hurt these hotels. We can't, we, we, you know, they, they, they don't have to go through the same regulations. This is, what about all the zoning stuff? And I'm like, who, who gives a damn about any of the zoning stuff? You're telling a property owner they're not allowed to do something to their property and allow somebody else to rent it. It's legal for me to buy a house and live in it. Why would it be illegal for me to buy a house and let somebody else live in it other than me? And for who, a weekend. Who were the people lobbying to keep Airbnb from Well, and operating. behold, it was the hotels that were yeah. doing it. it and it was industry. county board of supervisors, many of which that identified as Republicans, that were the ones pushing for legislation and at the state level did pass legislation. You voted against it. Yeah. But um, to, to, to regulate these things out of existence. The same thing happened in blue cities with Uber and Lyft. Mm -hmm. I, th this was also around the same time period, like 2015, 16, and 17. There were a lot of cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City that were trying to make it illegal for, Lube, uh, for, 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 for Uber and Lyft to, to operate in those cities. Why? Oh, because they were disrupting the taxi cab industry. Mm -hmm. Quick question. That, that was basically a, a government managed monopolized system. So what incentive does the government or these cities have in keeping these new industries from hurting traditional industries? So th this, is, this is an excellent point, and I can speak to this from direct experience as a legislator. So understand, everybody operates off of incentives, and this goes to the larger point I'm going to make. Every example she gave of an effective demonstration of a circular economy style mechanism was private sector. Right. It was, you know, AT&T or Sprint or whatever. The reason why they did this was not because the government came in and said, hey, we want you to develop this sort of phone plan. They said, you know what? We're actually losing a lot of value by creating these things and just selling them. It would actually be more valuable to us if people came back to us, you know, year after year after year and stayed on our phone plan. Well, how do we do that? Well, we got to give them better phones. Okay, well, these phones are kind of expensive. How do we reduce the overall cost of the phones? Well, we get their old phones back and we can either, again, sell those to a different market or we can utilize the component parts. That's what entrepreneurs do. They find efficiencies within the marketplace in order to please customers to make a profit. This is why whenever people talk about like you know, profit over people, like I don't know what to tell you. These two are not, these are not either or propositions. I mean, yes, if you're making a profit by hurting people, that's a bad thing. But profit is an indication that customers like what you're doing so much that they continue to, to give you their business. Right. So it, think of it as a scorecard, right? Like if, if, you're, if your profit is an A score, that means customers really like what you're doing and how you're doing it, mm -hmm. right? But what that also requires is for you to be able to attract labor that actually wants to work for your business. Because if labor doesn't want to work for your business, you can't produce things, which means you won't get a profit. So- Anyways, we, we just need to understand that it's it's a lot – some of this is, is fairly simple. Some of it is a little more complex than the explanations that we're given sometimes by people that want to tear it down. But 
Every example she gave was an example of the free market coming in with some sort of disruption. Politicians, right, have an incentive. And everyone thinks, oh, well, their incentive is to serve the people. <laughs> can, can, let me just tell you right now, I, I, I'm, I am sure that I, I can look at most of my colleagues and know that they, I, I think most of them want to do that and believe they are doing that and have also convinced themselves that there's no way they can do it unless they get reelected. And how do they get reelected? What's the Thomas Sowell quote? The Thomas Sowell quote is that the reason why so many politicians are such shameless liars, successful politicians are such shameless liars, is not just a reflection on them, it's a reflection on us. Because when you demand of the government things that it can't do, only liars will satisfy. Uh, that's not a that's not direct, but that's no. no, 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 no. I was thinking of the whole um, uh, politics is the art of making your selfish desires seem like the national interest. Well, and, and again, let, let's let, that's kind of the that's the a another great quote. Yeah, that's the that's the, the the caricature view, which I think is largely accurate in many respects. But let's let's give it the best uh, let's give it the best assumption possible. The people that get involved in politics want to help their communities. They're convinced that there's a particular way to help their communities. And then they get convinced that the only way that they can stay in power in order to help their communities is by doing X, Y, and Z. Well, when the hotel lobby, which writes really, really big checks, comes in and says, and by the way, they don't come in and just say, um, oh gosh, you need to regulate Airbnb because it's going to hurt our business. They don't say that. They come in and they say, do you realize that all these unregulated Airbnbs, there's all kinds of things that could happen in there. There's no sort of protections. We don't know if people even have fire extinguishers. What if there's a problem? And now we've got people that really don't know the intricacies of managing this sort of thing. This is a public and consumer safety issue. That's what they say. Like, oh, if you let this, what about the person that really just wants to human traffic? And so now they've set up their, their house in such a way and they put cameras all over there because they're going to watch people. These are the sort they of literally arguments say that are used. That. These are the sort of arguments that are used. It's never, don't do this because it'll hurt our business. It's, we have to comply with all of these rules and regulations and so should they. I had established Airbnbs, uh, not Airbnbs, but just bread and breakfast. Um, Bed and breakfast saying that, well, no, they, they have to follow all these other restrictions because we do. And I said, well, what sort of restrictions? Oh, well, they got to do this. They got to do that. They got to pay this tax. They got to. I said, I got a better idea. What if I just remove the restrictions and the taxes from you guys? Well, no, we, we don't. Nope, they didn't want that. No, no. Here's what they even said that was even more interesting. They said, well, no, no, we don't want those. Those things are good. I said, oh, so you think these things help your business? Absolutely. Well, then why would you want me to give them to your competition? If you think these things help your business... Why are you upset that your competition is not doing those things? And that's when it's like, well, you just don't care about you know people within. I remember your community. that meeting. I I remember the meeting where where you and I sat down with um all the not all but a huge number of these these bed and breakfasts within your district. And I remember you making this argument, and and there was one person that was like, this is ridiculous, and and like rolled their eyes and all this stuff. And I remember thinking to myself like. Oh, that, that was when it first dawned on me that like there, because I was, I was very young at the time, relatively speaking, I was like 21. I, I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but that, that's when it like first dawned on me that like, oh, not, not everybody like even conceptually agrees with me or Nick on these, these overarching philosophical, you know, questions about the economy and and government's role in it there there are people out there that that know that they, they will argue like until they're blue in the face in favor of of more government control and regulation yeah. and they genuinely think that it benefits them and that it benefits society as a whole for the government well, and, to, and, to oversee these type and, of in things. part here's how it generally starts out it generally starts out with an industry being frustrated with the government intervening within that environment. And so they start getting involved with politicians. And initially they started, they try to stop whatever regulations, taxes, and then the regulations or taxes eventually become inevitable. And so what they do is they try to manipulate the regulations or the taxes in order to make it more palatable. Well, now they're in a position where they've had to pay it or they've had to comply. Well, now some sort of disruption within the economy takes place, which is being able, is able to leverage the fact that they don't have to play by those same rules and they can offer different options. Well, now that same industry that used to fight the government works with the government to harm its competition. It's called a barrier to entry. 
And so now all of a sudden there's more licensure requirements, there's more um, regulatory compliance, there's more taxes. And you will see people like Amazon going, we're, we're all for a $15 minimum wage. Well, of course you are because you can station your workforce in places where a $15 minimum wage doesn't necessarily adversely impact you, but it could greatly impact other people that could potentially compete against you. And, and that's the problem with all of this. So Again, the, the, the larger point here with respect to the circular economy, with respect to property rights, is every example she gave of an, an effective circular economy arose from the free market being allowed to operate in order to find greater efficiencies, not the government imposing its will. Because every time the government does that, they don't just operate off of the best data available, they operate off of political incentives. Secondly, even if they are operating off the best data available, it's the best data available at the time they sign the law. Then all of a sudden things change. Technology develops. This has happened with green energy. We have perverted the course of green energy in this country because we have made it reliant on subsidies as opposed to the marketplace, which means if I want to develop green energy, I better develop I better develop it in such a way that gets me the government subsidy, not the best way to actually make it affordable on the marketplace or efficient or effective on the marketplace. So this is why we have landfills with, with old like blades from uh, wind turbines, you know, filling up landfills. Like, was that better for the economy on the whole? I, I mean, after you killed a bunch of bald eagles, right? And then you put that, was that better for the economy as a, or, or for the environment as a whole? Were, were the rare earth minerals that you needed in order to make that wind turbine, was that better on the... See, these are all questions that would be asked by somebody operating in the free market because they are on the hook if it fails. They don't ask it if they're worried about government subsidies. And quite frankly, that's also a perverse efficiency within the market. You want to talk about profit over people? Let me tell you what profit over people looks like, really looks like. Profit over people is when I as, a, is I, as a producer, I, as a business owner, decide that people don't want to buy my product at the prices I can afford to sell it at. So I go to the government and I have the government steal their money through taxes and then give it to me in the form of subsidies. That's profit over people. And guess what? It is, it is epidemic in socialist economies where it's the state running those organizations and institutions and fascist economies. But here's the, here's the real question. Here's the, here's the last thing I want people to consider. And then we're going to go into some other questions that we actually got on a uh, circle. Um, when you look at, at what, what people that kind of claim to be on the left say they want within the American economy, even within certain aspects of the circular or the economy. Danish economy, <laughs> right? Or the Danish economy. And, and keep in mind, the concept of a circular economy is not problematic. It really isn't. It's only problematic if the state is trying to impose it. But if you look at the people pushing for a circular economy, here's what I've noticed. They don't start companies engaging in these sorts of efficiencies in order to be more competitive on the, on the marketplace. Nope. They engage in civic action. They engage in political action, right? So they're not trying to influence the market with a better product that does what they want. They're trying to influence politicians to impose what they want. And that will always come with perverse incentives. So as I look at all this through the lens of property rights, through the lens of personal property, here's what I discover. The people that are pushing for this don't want a socialist economy. In the most cases, they don't want a socialist economy. They recognize. That's why the WEF talks about stakeholder capitalism. That's why you hear things like circular economy. They understand that the complete abolition of the private ownership of the means of production is probably very difficult to achieve and probably wouldn't achieve the, the results they want because they can, they're smart enough to look at history. So do they argue for free market capitalism? No, they argue for, they argue fascist for a 21st econ- century version of fascism. They argue for fascist economic policy. They argue for that you can still own your company. You just have to produce. Your, your boards have to look the way we want. And now you actually have major investment firms doing the same thing. right? Which, which again, people could argue, well, isn't that free market? It is if those companies are not actually working hand in glove with the government and they're not relying on inflationary monetary policy in order to boost their books and to give them an economic advantage within the marketplace. So now all of a sudden... DEI, 
ESG, all of these things are being used for the government eventually to decide and for these larger firms which are working hand in glove with the government to decide what your board looks like, what you produce, how you produce it, right? You see more emphasis, less emphasis on property rights, right? And access to personal property and more emphasis on, well, no, 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 the companies will own the goods. The companies will own the products because after all, that will create an incentive structure for them to be able to create something which is more longer lasting or easy to, to break apart and use for its component parts. This will all happen, right? And, and you will just have access to these products, which again, in some cases makes sense and is, is not necessarily a bad thing. But here's my other question. What happens when the vast, vast majority of ownership is concentrated in the hand of a couple of companies who have now been cartelized, right? Put into various cartels, which are being closely monitored and watched and, and, and regulated by the government, Right now we're sitting here fighting between, well, is the government really controlling the economy or, or are customers and producers controlling the economy? Again, this gets back to what I was saying earlier that like when you, when you create a, a, you know, centrally command, uh, you know, when, when, when you create a command economy, yeah. right, right. Um, you're, you're shifting these signals because the, the signals are going to exist no matter what. I said that earlier. This, it, it, there will always be signals being sent. The question is who's sending them? Yep. Are people going to be sending them through their own actions that they get to, to make with their feet, with their pocketbooks? Are they going to be the ones telling producers what to produce, telling sellers what to sell, how yep. much to sell, what prices to charge? Or is it going to be a, a government pure, you know, bureaucrat that yep. does it? And, and, do you, and, and do you really believe that those bureaucracies are? Or is working? it going to be BlackRock that does it, yeah. or the WEF that does it? It's the same. It doesn't. It doesn't matter who's doing it. It doesn't even matter if it's not the government. If it's just other actors that are working in, in conjunction with the government, you're still creating perverse incentives. You're creating false signals. And by the way, this is also how you create bubbles. Yeah. Yep. Because within monetary policy, within fiscal policy, the same thing applies, especially within monetary policy. If the market is saying we want X, but it's a, a, a cabal, so to speak, of people that are saying, no, we're going to deliver Y, that also can exist within, within monetary policy. This is how you get the boom bust cycle. Yeah, because, because essentially what is happening is that you're encouraging people to invest in large scale infrastructure projects. For that are not going to deliver the, the return that, that yeah. they should be returning. For a customer base that ultimately isn't there. And so now you have basically devalued capital, which has to be tr try to be. Um, this is also how you get a lot of zombie companies on yeah. Wall Street that have multi-billion dollar valuations, but can't turn a cent in profit. Yeah. And that there's this difference between that and a company that is new to the game yeah. and, and is working towards yeah, profitability. Most companies take a few years in order to yes. work toward profitability. Amazon took many years to become profitable, yeah. but they eventually became profitable. There's a difference between that and a company who has no plans to ever become profitable, but they have an endless supply of credit, yeah. again, because we have we have distorted the marketplace through government intervention, through the actions of the Federal Reserve, in order to incentivize these bubble companies being created, many of which have bought hook, line, and sinker in large part because that's really what they're supposed to be doing, yeah. into the DEI stuff, into all the equity stuff, all the stuff that BlackRock and the WWF is pushing. It th This is, in some ways, you can't separate woke capital from inflationary monetary policy. Yeah. No, the no, whole, that's absolutely true. Go woke, BlackRock, go broke. I'll tell like, you right now, BlackRock is in for it because they were they were so dependent on, on inflationary monetary policy to, to push a lot of what they're doing. They're going to get to a point where when companies are not able to produce what they're supposed to produce at the prices they should because they're so consumed with this DEI and ESG bull crap, there's going to be there's going to be a backlash. Couple couple other things I want to get some questions. Jack asks, have they shown the coffee cup yet today? All I can see is the top of it. Here's the coffee cup. I think it's very appropriate for today. This is the, let me make sure. Yeah, this is the socialism, <laughs> literally why we can't have nice things. Um, I had some other questions from, again, uh, Amanda, who, who you know, helped us kind of develop the thought process for the show. Oh, yeah. By the way, this all, the, literally the topic came from one of our listeners, I regular listeners. Like and times, I'm just reiterating. I swear you don't listen we're, to me. No, I'm, re, I'm reiterating <laughs> because we're an hour and a half into this, and there's a good chance that somebody might have joined the live stream in the middle of the show and doesn't know this. For, for, for those that have recently joined us, or for those that, that are 
um, listening on audio and maybe just skip to this random point in the podcast. Um, th- th- this was a suggestion from one of our listeners in Circle. So if you if you ever want to like pitch an idea, yeah, um, go and join Circle and and throw out some ideas because a lot of honestly a lot of our really good episode you know topics have have come from other people that have asked Nick. I want I I want you to make the argument on this or I want you to explain this you know that th- th- this factor. Here's the actual original question. Um, so I, I got them right here. So one of the questions was what personal property is and what it all could mean to an individual who possesses it. You know, we discussed this a little bit, the difference between private property and kind of a broader category and personal property is that property, which you own, which is movable and, and what it means to the individual who possesses it. I mean, again, obviously we're, we're not making this argument that, you know, the life is all about materialistic, you know, owning of possessions or whatnot, but obviously the, the fact that we have developed in such a way to where a poor person living in a, in a Western economy and, and, and other economies as well, but I'm, I'm just using, let's use the United States as an example. A poor person living in the United States has access to personal property items that would have been considered incredible luxuries 40 or 50 years ago, 10 years ago, 20, 20 years ago, really. And two or 300 years ago would have been considered magic. Yes. <laughs> and that, and that, that really is an important thing to understand is that what, what's valuable about that is that a lot of those objects, and again, people will point out that, you know, Hey, is, is it really a good thing that everybody has so much smartphones and they're, they're just constantly addicted to them? Obviously, you know, possessions can have negative attributes and positive attributes. It's how they're applied by the person. But the fact that we, so many people have access um, to things that again, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a hundred years ago, just would have like, I think Chris had said it best would have either been considered luxury or magic is, is pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible. Um, when the defense of one's own property could be a good reason to exercise force against an aggressor. This was a great question because, um, this is someone that is, you know, living uh, overseas right now. And she pointed out that, gosh, where I'm living right now, it would be considered just insane that you would potentially, you know, harm someone or maybe shoot someone because they, they, they came into your, your house. And here, here's the argument. Like, and, and she specifically asked about castle doctrine, which castle doctrine is the idea that you have the right to defend your castle. And so if somebody, let's say somebody breaks in your house at, at 3 a.m. and you shoot them, Castle doctrine would legally protect you because you were defending, you know, your, yourself and your property. And she was saying that in the European country she lives in, this would just like, people would just think this was insane. Part of that's because they have such strict gun laws in all these places. The idea you'd even own a gun in the first place would seem insane, which I, I kind of, <laughs> I, I had somebody that said as, <laughs> as a German, here, well, let me see if I can, as a German, I cannot understand why you would why you would own all these guns in the United States. It was like, really? Cause I think all of your neighbors should have gotten it at some point, at some point in the 20th century, all of your neighbors figured out real quick why it might be a good idea to own a gun. If you live close to the German army. Anyway, <laughs> the idea is, the idea is, is that again, in the United States, we place a high value on individual Liberty, which requires not only your property rights and personal property rights, but ultimately your means to be able to defend or protect them. Because if you were completely reliant on the state to provide your protection, one, that's a very inefficient model Two, the state can easily become the sort can become the adversary. And, and we've seen so many examples of this throughout time that to deny it or to suggest that, oh, we're way past those days is just to be historically ignorant, quite frankly. So w- what's the whole purpose of this castle doctrine? I would say it's twofold. One, it reinforces the notion that you have an inherent right to defend what is yours. Now, does that mean if someone steps on your lawn, you can start blasting? Obviously not. All right. One of the things that castle doctrine is specific toward is this idea that again, um, you're operating off the assumption that you have a right to protect yourself and your family from someone that is potentially trespassing, but there has to be more of a perceived threat than somebody just walked across your grass. All right. So, so some of these arguments that get used against the castle doctrine are are quite frankly, a not fair representation of what it's meant to do. So that's, that's the the kind of the, the foundational idea. You have a right to defend your property. If you believe that you and your property are in danger, you have a right to use physical force. Again, there's still some restrictions on the level of deadly force that you can use. Um, but it's there. Here's the other practical, um, practical consideration with that. If you live in a society where people both have the means and the right to hurt you, (laughs) if you come on and try to steal their stuff or hurt them, 
it, it has, it has, let's say a dampening effect <laughs> on the sort of people that would want to come and try to hurt you. Right. And, and we, and we see this. And now a lot of times people will say, well, the United States is like third in the world and gun violence, you know, out of a hundred and you know, 90 countries or whatever it is. O- okay. Fair enough. But can we also, can we also be honest in stating that if you took out Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, and I think two other metropolitan, major metropolitan like Baltimore cities. And yeah. We go from Memphis. like, we go from the top 10 to like 180. Right, so we we've got the vast majority of inappropriate or illegal gun violence taking place because there is such a thing. There is such a thing as legal and appropriate gun violence. For instance, you're trying to murder me, I shoot you. That that may go on the gun violence statistics, but we would say that okay, actually that was that was a fair and just use of of you know both a gun and violence. So that's the important thing to consider is is one. You have that inherent right, and it's hard to say that you have that inherent right if you don't have at least some ability to be able to provide for it yourself. And then secondly, it, it has a it, it dissuades people from engaging in that sort of activity. Another question was, uh, what right do others have to the personal property of others, if at all? This is a great question, and this is one of the reasons why we, we say that to erode property rights is not to make people wealthier, it's not to make people more equal, but what it essentially does is it makes the individual more dependent on whoever actually controls the property. And, and in most situations where it's the state controlling that property, um, it, again, there's, there's two things that are, are problematic. One is fundamental. If I am if I am essentially saying that anytime you own property, I as the state or another individual can come in and take it, I actually discourage you from engaging in productive activities. You want a case in point on this one? California. I I actually in, in another state, I don't I think it was in California, it might have been in the Bay Area. I watched, I watched as a bunch of local politicians got up at a Walmart that was closing down and basically said, how dare you? Don't you understand that our community needs, you know, the, the groceries and the services you provide? How dare you pack up and leave? The same city officials that were essentially creating an environment to where Walmart couldn't operate at a sufficient profit to stay open because people were coming in and stealing their stuff had the audacity to show up and say, no, 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 the bad guy here is not the people that were responsible for providing the police force and the legal system to protect people's private property or to protect people's ability to go and engage and purchase personal property were the ones condemning the business that said, look, we can't operate under these conditions. So whenever you have a system that essentially acts, and you see this all the time with this whole argument of positive rights, every once in a while I like to go on and kind of troll leftist pages where they'll say like, you know, you you deserve a right to free housing or to free healthcare or to free clothing or to free, I'm like, okay, great. And, and out of all the people that apparently deserve this right, who is then going to be made responsible for producing the healthcare and the housing and the clothing and the food? Who's going to do that? And, and again, their answer is, well, we, you know, we all have to contribute. Okay, well, what's your contribution other than this meme? Other than this stupid social media statement, what's been your contribution to producing the goods and services that you think everyone deserves or is entitled to? And the problem with pushing that sort of narrative is that it creates an expectation within people that don't know better that, oh, well, of course I can go in and take stuff from the local Walgreens because they've got a lot of it and I don't. And besides, insurance will cover them anyways, not to mention the fact that my local district attorney or commonwealth attorney won't prosecute me for this and politicians will step in and punish the business if they try to leave. It's even worse than that. In California, earlier this month, the California Senate passed uh, what's called SB 553. And what that does is is effectively makes it illegal for stores and employees of stores, for businesses and employees of those businesses to physically confront or stop an act of shoplifting within their own business. Yeah. Add that to the fact that in California, it's already the case where you can steal up to $1,000 worth of goods and not be prosecuted. What the California Senate has done and what the House will probably do, and most likely Governor Newsom because he's he's an idiot, what, what, what they're on the verge of doing is literally legalizing theft up to $1,000 
for stores in California, legalizing theft because you are making it non-prosecutable to steal a thousand dollars worth of goods and you're making it illegal for stores to take matters into their own hands and say, well, if we can't prosecute, then the very least we can do is prevent them yeah. from walking into our stores and stealing our stuff. No, that yep. that will now, it will now be punishable by law for a business owner to prevent somebody from shoplifting, but it won't be punishable by law for the shoplifter to shoplift. Mm -hmm. Cal <laughs> California is doomed, man. Oh, it really is. I, I mean, this, this is the part where I feel like Detroit, went through all the trouble of really destroying what used to be one of the wealthiest cities in America. And, and California said, I bet we could do that with an entire state. What if we just Detroitificated? Yeah. Can we Detroit Detroitification the entire, the entire golden state of California? Like, and then people wonder why San Francisco lost 8% of their population in one year. People wonder why Los Angeles County, Los Angeles County used to have 10 million residents, largest County in America. It now has, I think like 9.8 million. <laughs> Zine Tyler, without Walmart, where will people steal their random crap? It's it's a good question. It's a good question, and one and one California politicians clearly have not really considered. Now, uh, honestly, if you live in California, um, here's what you should do. Maybe maybe you shouldn't do this, but I have a feeling some people will consider this. I I I could imagine a scenario where some conservatives in California say, "Oh, okay, this is now the law. Let me go to every single store that has a uh, rainbow flags, you know, LGBT stuff, woke woke nonsense plastered on there, anything that has a Newsom sign in the store, and let me just walk in and just steal a thousand dollars worth of stuff and walk out. It's legal. Yeah, why not? Why well, it's, I, I it's like literally it. codified in law. It's legal to do it. Why not? I like the collectivist coffee shop. I think it was in New York City where they set up um, an idea where people just paid what they could." Right. It was, it was from each according to their ability and to each according. How long did they need. stay in business? Not long. Yeah. Not long. It, it turned out, turned out some people on the left took advantage of it. I mean, well, I, I like to ask the question whenever if you're people, a business owner in California, why, why are you still in that state at this point? Well, I mean, cause sometimes it's hard to move, especially depending on the business. And there are, I mean, look, it's a big state. There are other areas that are not operating at the same level of insanity as the Bay area and Los Angeles and other places. I, I look, I was born in born and raised in, in Northern California in Chico, California. And when I was growing up there, it was a, a small agricultural town. We had a state university, um, you know, Chico state, which was, was an interesting anyway. Um, but I look, I, 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 I loved it. I loved it. And I'll, I remember when the housing boom hit, we had a bunch of people from the Bay Area selling their homes at that point for you know just egregious amounts. And then moving up to Chico, California, it became something where, where the Wall Street Journal actually listed little Chico, California as the most overvalued real estate market in the country at one point because of this, this influx of people that had you know wads of cash from selling their property. And what was interesting was they didn't just move to, they moved to Chico because they could get you know the kind of a more rural environment, a small little cool town um, and, and all of that. <laughs> and, and instead of just moving up there and be like, well, this is really great. I, I'm so glad to be a, a member of this community and, and I'm, I'm so glad to get away from what I left. Nope. Nope, it was, we're going to move up here and we're going to run for town council and we're going to run for the board of supervisors and we're going to run for the school board and, and we're going to make this exactly like the place we fled. <laughs> you County voted for Joe Biden in 2020. Yeah, which is nuts. That never would have happened when I was growing up there. Never. I, never. I, I'm, I'm telling you, like, like California is a total lost cause. I've got family that has moved there. My aunt, um, my aunt Marina moved uh, from California to South Florida um, because... It, 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 she she spent basically her whole life living in Los Angeles County. She 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 lived in the Burbank area, and I I mean it is unfathomable what has happened to that state when you look at things like property rights, the state of the economy, crime, like yeah. like simple functions of government. It's it, it is a failed state, and now they're they're doing things even worse on a moral level. They're, they're, they're trying to push for, and we we briefly talked about this, I believe, in a previous podcast, where in California, they're trying to take parents away from children if the state decides that the child wants to, to go through gender transitioning and the parent disagrees. The state will take the, the parent away. So- 
Your L- business is, is being destroyed. Your family's being destroyed. It's too expensive. Crime is out of control. I have no idea other than the weather, and you can get the weather in Florida. I, I have no idea why anybody would want to stay well, in the, that the, state. The, the larger, the larger kind of ar- argument with the topic that we're talking about is that, interestingly enough, when private property rights are ignored or diminished, it doesn't mean that everybody has more stuff. It means that the state increasingly looks at you as its property. Yes. Yes. And and that's what we're starting to see. We've seen it with our children. We're going to start to see it with more. I mean, this is why the frustration that people have with the amount of taxes that they pay is that because ultimately there's this recognition that if you can, if you can not only tax me on what I purchase, you can not only tax me on my income, but you can also tax me on my property to where there's a point where I never truly own anything because the moment I'm delinquent in something, you can take it all away from me. Right. That, that's the point where people start to say, how free, how free am I? How free am I? And then when the response is, well, but you're getting all of these services. <sighs> am I? Because the yeah. services suck. I want well, a refund. This, this, is a per- <laughs> this is a perfect example, too, of, of California. We, we, did an, we did a Y minute on this, and I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. We did a Y minute on this where we talked about how one of the reasons why people are leaving high tax areas to lower tax areas is not because they had a problem with the high taxes per se. They're leaving because they were told the high taxes produced superior services. And what they got was homeless encampments outside of their kids' middle school. And when they complained about it, they were told they were bigots. That's one of the primary reasons why people are leaving now. Because all of a sudden, they went to Texas, and they went to Florida, and they went to other states with lower taxes. And lo and behold, there were still roads and schools and police services it, it turns out that they didn't need to be paying these exorbitant taxes, these exorbitant fines for existing. I, I, love it when, I love it when people on the left go, you know, human beings are the only ones that got to pay to exist. I got news for you, Haas. Everyone pays to exist just in different ways. If you really want to join the rules of the laws of the jungle, right? I, I got news for you. The gazelle pays to exist, usually with their life when they can't outrun the cheetah. All right, so this idea that you got to work for a living, that's not a result of capitalism. That's a result of reality. And the fact that if you want to feed yourself, you're going to have to contribute something. And oh, by the way, the reason why you decided to work for somebody was because your labor was more valuable working for them than it was trying to grow your own crops, make your own clothes, and do everything else. Not that we're against homesteading. No, Growing I, your own crops can it. be a positive thing. <laughs> we, we, just, we just processed 23 chickens yesterday. But the point is, the point of all of this is, is that, again, it's, it's d- diminishing of property rights in general leads to fewer options with respect to personal property. And then, inevitably, the state starts seeing you as their property. Because, again, if they're the ones running everything and they need labor, right, and you no longer represent a free person operating in a society in, in order to find your place within the economy, within the marketplace of ideas, within social structures, if you can no longer find that out for yourself, that's not going to be assigned to you by the state. Well, then everything you consume makes you a burden. Everything you produce makes you an asset. Everything you consume makes you a burden. And when the state's the one controlling everything, I got news for you. You're always a burden. You're always a burden. Because they've incentivized consumption. It's this, it, again, it's that, it's that Marxist model of from each according to their ability to each according to their needs that actually disincentivizes productivity because the more you can produce, the more they're going to demand it of you. Eventually. And, it, and the other thing that it does, the other thing it does is that it disincentivizes, or it, sorry, it incentivizes need. It incentivizes you to create needs that might not have otherwise existed because, again, if it's to each according to their need, well, then the way that I get stuff within this Marxist economy, which is abolished private ownership of the means of production, the way I get it is not by being more productive. It's by being more needy. So the, the overall question, the overall answer to all of this on the whole, you will own nothing and love it. Look, there are elements. There are elements of this concept within the circular economy that works. But it only works if property rights and personal property rights are well established and in place. Because it's fine for you to be able to share your property. It's fine for you to be able to decide, you know what? It's better for me to lease a car or it's better for me to you know, use these other mechanisms within the economy than it is for me to own a particular object or, or whatever it is. That's fine 
as long as the property rights are in place and the personal property rights are in place. The moment the state is the one that owns it or the moment they have disincentivized ownership to such a degree to where now almost everything is owned by a select few entities, the more enticing it will become for politicians to control those entities. And one of the things that we have to guard against with all these nice sounding ideas, one of the most the important questions that we always have to ask is, okay, great, how do you plan to implement it? And the moment they say, we've got legislation in the world, that's the moment where you pull back and you say, wait a second, no. You are not going to diminish property rights. You're not going to diminish personal property rights because the moment you do, I know what happens next. I don't get all the things that I need. And the only time I do get some of the things I need is when the state graciously allows for me to have them. And that is never the sort of position that you want to be in. This whole concept of freedom from want requires the state to own everything never equals greater political freedom never equals greater economic freedom. It only equals more dependency on the state. And it turns out that the very thing that they have promised you when you exchange your political and economic freedom, more goods, more services, turns out that doesn't happen either. And the reason why it doesn't happen is because there's something inherently immoral about the state, about some sort of centralized authority telling you that you don't have the ability to own the means of production. You don't have the ability to own the necessary tools to improve your life because someone's going to own them. Someone is going to own them. And if it's not the individual that has the right to own them, don't be surprised when things go really, really bad very, very quickly. All right. I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, I want to thank Amanda for for positing the question for us. We yeah. really appreciate it. I want to thank you to our, our uh, Tui who came on and, and donated uh, to us today. We really appreciate that as well. Uh, again, we want to continue to do this for a long time. I want to, I want to and, and again, those donations really help us. We do a lot of episodes. We can't monetize on YouTube. We intentionally turn the monetization off. We intentionally off. turn the monetization off because we want to be able to talk with it about our audience, but we understand that the moment we do, we actually draw attention from YouTube and we encourage them to either silence us, shut us down, or demonetize us. So when you when people do contribute, it actually means a lot. The other thing, too, that we've been kicking around, it's been an idea for a while now, and we'd love to get your feedback on. We've had a lot of people ask us about our mugs <laughs> yep. because of, of the, the reels I do on um, Instagram and shorts on YouTube and things like that. If you guys think that would be a great idea, please let us know. Let us know. Join our circle. Um, go in there. Hamilton, can he has the links, I think, and everything that we do. Go on there. Uh, let us know. Let us know um, whether or not you think that would be a good idea. Is that something that you would like for and us to produce? If you have any ideas, we'd and love if you have to some get ideas. ideas. If you have some, let us know what your favorite mugs are uh, that we have. So that we, we, we've got some people. One of the things that it's actually been really tough for us on this, because people have been asking us for a while, why, have, why we have not done this already. One, we want to ensure a quality product. And, and if we all of a sudden get, you know, 300 orders overnight, that's going to be tough. And two, we don't want to use some of the more common, um, you know, print firms out there. Uh, we actually had one of our coffee mugs. I, I had somebody send me a coffee mug for Christmas and it was a picture of Washington crossing the Delaware and the text on it said, you know, America, we will cross a frozen river at night to kill you on Christmas. We know we've done it before. And it was all referring to George Washington crossing the Delaware river on Christmas to fight the Hessians. I think it was cafe press said they would not print that mug. And so um, we, you know, thankfully they found somebody else that would print it for them. They got it to me in time for Christmas, and I really appreciated it. But uh, that is one of our commitments. We're trying to we're trying to find good producers that we can work with on that. So join Circle. Let us know about what topics you would like to see in the future. One of the things that was really beneficial about the the information they gave us for this topic is they didn't just say, Hey, can you talk about this? They gave us like six or seven questions that they had conversations that they had been in circumstances where they wanted a better answer for, for how they can engage with someone and kind of explain the, the importance of property rights, of personal property, what it means, why it's necessary for a free society. I hope we have done a good job of answering all of those questions. Let us know what you'd like to see in the future. Thank you very much. And we will see you next episode.